All right, so let's turn to the Word, and um, I'm going to break away from Colossians, but obviously continue in the same theme and go to uh, the first epistle to the Corinthians. First Corinthians and uh, chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. And let's read from verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Jews seek, request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But now of him you are in Christ Jesus. Who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, but I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And obviously, that is probably a good summation of everything we've said this weekend. It's exactly the same message. It doesn't change. Uh, between the different uh, epistles of Paul. And I, I just want to just spend a few minutes talking um, ab about that passage because uh, it would hopefully just further clarify and cement in our hearts uh, some of the um, aspects that we have spoken of. Uh, Paul says there are two kinds of people. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. But those two groups represent two types of people in any society. The Jews are marked by their desire for the miraculous, for signs. The Greeks are marked by their desire for clever philosophy, argument, and debate. And those are the two things that we deal with today. There are those on the one side who are into the spectacular and the miracles and the wonders and the signs and the emotional and uh, all of those spectacular kinds of things. And there are many who look at those things and they say, well, you know, that, that's very shallow. It's emotionalism. And there are many today who have gone to the other extreme as a result. And I'm not putting names to these groups. You can figure them out for yourself. So they go to the other extreme. They say, well, you know, we're, we're not shallow like those guys over there. We, we, we're deep. We think about these things. We reason them out. We study the scriptures. We study the fathers. We study the commentaries and the Greek and the Hebrew. And the answers are in that and... They don't recognize that they're just as shallow as the emotional ones. Because in the emotional side, in the spectacular side, it doesn't deal with the real issues of the heart. And the same on the intellectual side. Those are the two extremes. And just as then, today, the message of the cross 
And I, I don't use the term, the message of the cross, in the same sense that Jimmy Swaggart does. But Paul uses that term here, and so I'm bound by it. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who seek wisdom. And it is weakness to those who seek a sign. Verse 21 says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased the Lord, pleased God through foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The message we preach is foolish to those who perish. And maybe you've been sitting or listening or watching on video these messages and you say, well, you know, it just doesn't ring my bell. I didn't see any miracles. I didn't see any display of God's power. I didn't hear any clever arguments that I haven't new knowledge that's been revealed. Paul says we, we preach Christ to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. And maybe as you listened over these days, you, you say, well, you know, that's pretty simplistic. It's foolish. Where's the power? Where's the miracles? Where's the signs? And Paul says that the, the message is a stumbling block and it is foolishness. So I don't want to play some cheap psychological trick on you. But if you have a problem with what we have been saying on the basis that it is not intellectually stimulating enough or it is not spectacular enough, you're actually condemning yourself by this passage. You see, we say, well, you know, we live in different times, but in fact, nothing has changed. So let's have a look at the context in which Paul is speaking. He says that the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. Stumbling block to the Jews. The problem for the Jews was that there's a scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 21 that says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. The, the context is, it's a little difficult if you look at that, those verses in, in Deuteronomy 21. I'm not going to go there because I want to uh, move along so we can get to the Lord's table, which is really the most important thing. But in Deuteronomy, and this is the law, part of the law, he is not talking about crucifixion. But he is talking about a provision that God makes in the law for someone who commits a crime that is so blasphemous or so heinous that he is executed by stoning. The context speaks about stoning. And then after he had been stoned, he is hung on a tree or a pole. And it was a sign to everyone who passed by that this man is cursed by God. It's, it was the, the, the highest form of judgment that could be, exe that could be executed under the law. And there are a number of examples in the Old Testament. As you, if you search through, you'll find a number of examples where this actually happens. And so when Jesus hangs on the cross, it is a sign to the Jews that God has cursed him. That God has cursed him. And now Paul is saying, that man that hung on that tree is the one who is the Messiah. 
And you understand how they stumbled at that. How can he save us if he is cursed of God? And to make it worse, what Paul is saying is your ethnicity as Jews doesn't help you at all. Your religiosity hasn't helped you. All of your feasts and all of the animals that you've slaughtered and, and all of the things you've done, there's no salvation in those things whatsoever. There's salvation only in looking at that man that was put on the pole, just like the serpent. And the Jews could not stomach that. You remember how Paul would go from city to city and he would preach and uh, the Jews would receive him into the, into the synagogue because he was a, a recognized rabbi. And uh, they, they would love his preaching until he got to the point of saying, well, Jesus is the Christ and he was buried and he rose again. And they would run him out of town every time. Because the message was just too simple. And the message was abhorrent. You're asking me to believe in that man who was crucified? And if he was the savior of Israel, how come he never delivered us? How come he allowed the Romans to, to crucify him like that? How come he was such, died such, an ignom, uh, 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 such a shameful death? And you're saying he is the king? He is the Messiah? You're asking me to do something which is impossible. The Greeks likewise, the simple Jew walking around in Galilee, associating with simple people, preaching a simple message of faith in himself. And then he died and he was crucified. Just foolish. Salvation in that? That is the best that God could come up with. And then to make it worse, to say that he was God in the flesh, to the Greeks that was a, just as abhorrent to, as to say that, that he was nailed to the tree. Because everything of the flesh to them was evil. And so there's no way that God could ever Take on human form, human flesh. And John deals with that in his, in his epistles. So everything about the cross and everything about the Lord Jesus was unattractive in every respect. There was nothing beautiful about it. There was nothing attractive about it. There was nothing that pleased the human mind, there was nothing that pleased the human emotions. It was a despicable, horrible thing in every way you would look at it. And yet Paul says, that's the message. And the problem we have today is there, there is there's tremendous pressure on preachers to dress up the message, to change the message. And they indeed do that. And Christians are deceived into following a different message. When I first came to the church that I serve now 16 years ago, in one of the rooms, and Inna will remember, in one of the rooms there was a wooden cross. But the cross was draped with a silken scarf thing. Very beautiful, very artistic. The cross was never draped with silver or gold. It was an ugly thing because it dealt with the ugly issue of my sin. There's nothing glamorous about the cross. Today we wear the cross around our necks, we hang it on our walls, we have all sorts of nice art about the cross, and I'm not opposed, I have a cross in our church, there's a long story about that, but I won't get into that, 
But the cross is a terrible place. It's a place where the dear Son of God took my sin upon himself. Where he who knew no sin became sin for us and bore our shame and our guilt and the wrath of God as God laid upon him the iniquities of us all and together with that the punishment of our sin. But Paul says that's our message because that's the message that saves and that's the message that keeps and the problem is that we don't want that message anymore. We don't want to think about that terrible day when the darling of heaven was stripped naked and nailed to the tree. We like to think about the resurrection. We like to think about the second coming. We don't like to think about his glorification. But the cross is just not that glamorous. But you see, there's a second problem. And the second problem is that the cross does not remain on Calvary's hill. Because Jesus now says, if you want to be my disciple. You need to take up that same cross. Deny yourself. See the principle of the world? He says, no, say, deny yourself. One of the prosperity preachers very recently said that if anyone teaches that you must deny himself, he has a demon. But in fact, she didn't understand. She doesn't even know the scriptures. It's sufficient to know that she was calling demon Jesus a demon because Jesus was the one who said, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. You see, we, we, we can still live with a cross back there 2,000 years ago. We can still accept the fact that Jesus was nailed to that tree. But when he now says, I want you to die, to your own flesh, to your own ambitions, to your own desires, to your own form of religion, to your own ideas. Die to yourself. It becomes too hard. But we saw in Colossians that unless we have died with him, we cannot be raised with him. You see, you, you can't get the new life without getting the death. The two go together. And so Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And folk, it's not, it, it, it wasn't a matter of just wearing a, a, a gold cross around his neck or a, a cross on a rope around his waist. It was a reality that the day Jesus met him on that road to Damascus, Paul died to his, to his ethnicity. Paul died to his traditions. Paul died to his own righteousness. Paul died to everything that he held dear and held precious at that moment. And he says, I counted it rubbish, but I may grab hold of Jesus. Folk, we want Jesus. We want the stuff that we've been speaking of in these last two days. But you can't have that unless you relinquish self and the things that you hold dear and that you hold precious and that are important to you that do not speak of Jesus and him crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Maybe that's a question we should ask as we come to the Lord's table this afternoon. Does this just speak of what Jesus did? Sometimes we even forget what he did. Has this become real in my life? Have I been crucified with him? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, 
but Christ lives in me. The message of these last few days. How can Christ live in me? Only once I've been crucified with him. How can he increase in me? Only to the degree that I'm willing to decrease. Folk, I believe that there's an important question we must ask every time we come to the Lord's table. And that is not just to remember that he died and that he was crucified. But there is the question, am I still dead? Yes, you heard right. Am I still dead? Because we say, well, I I was crucified with Christ. The problem is that we resurrect ourselves. There's no scripture for that, but it's real. We resurrect ourselves and blow life into the old flesh again, and there we off we go, in the flesh again. Let him take up his cross daily. And as we come to the table, we need to examine ourselves, and I believe one of the questions we must ask ourselves as we, as we prepare for the table is, have I been dying for Christ? Or is the flesh dominant in my life? Maybe I did die at one time, but somehow I've taken up the flesh again. And folks, that is, that is the gospel. That is the center of our faith. We cannot get away from that. And I'm so glad you guys break bread every week because it brings us back to, to the basics every week. It brings us back to the same issue every week, that we have no other message but Christ and him crucified. And so Paul says, I am determined to know nothing or anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's our message. And as I close, I appeal to you. If there is anything else that you're embracing, your own righteousness, your own religiosity, your own philosophy, your own ideas, relinquish them at the cross this, morning, this afternoon. Whatever God has been speaking to you over these last two days, won't you die to those things right now? That his life may infuse us. I'm crucified with him. Is that real? Or is it just theory? Amen.